Engine Cable Thief. Hello, everyone. So this is the first time I've spoken out loud for like a day and a half because I lost my voice and I've been walking around like a breathy Hannibal Lecter. So if I suddenly start squeaking like a teenage boy, please forgive me. I'm just going to be sucking on this thing. So today we're going to be talking about some Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi hacking stuff. In particular, we're going to be talking about rogue access point attacks or evil access point attacks or whatever you feel like calling them. Uh, and it's a kind of a continuation of a talk that we did in 2014. Uh, we released something called the MANA Toolkit. So the way we're going to talk about stuff is there's three scenarios. And you might not be doing exactly what the scenario is describing, but I'm just using them as examples to kind of go through some of the capabilities, tools, and techniques that we'll be releasing today. So my name's Singe. This is Michael Kruger, underscore Cable Thief, but we're trying to call him Squiddle Boy. So if you're looking to give him a nickname, please help us out there. We work at a company called SensePost. It's a penetration testing company based predominantly out of South Africa and London, and we've been going for about 18 years. We were told we weren't allowed to use PowerPoint, so this is a PDF. That used to be an animated GIF in the corner, so anyway. All right, so the first scenario, we're gonna jump straight in. Uh, in 2012, a colleague of mine, Glenn Wilkinson, and uh, Daniel Cuthbert released something called Snoopy. Anyone here ever use Snoopy? Three people, cool. <laughs> Sorry? I, sorry, I can't hear you here. Uh, so Snoopy is, was a, a framework for tracking wireless devices, um, trying to like geolocate them based on networks that they were looking for, and then using the fact that the device ID was unique. Fortunately, in 2018, Snoopy is dead. Yeah, they killed Snoopy. And... <laughs> And the primary reason Snoopy is dead is because uh, there's been some changes to the way device manufacturers make their, their things work across Wi-Fi. So the first thing is that uh, passive sniffing is mostly doesn't work anymore. It's for two reasons I'll go into now. And the other thing is that device manufacturers have changed the default behavior that instead of a device going, hey, is my home network nearby? It just says, hey, are there networks nearby? And is one of them my home network? So it, does, it tries not to reveal the networks it's looking for in its preferred network list. Uh, but I first spoke about the, the Spectrum issue. So this is a really awesome tool called Wi-Fi Explorer. It's commercial, but um, if you want to play with Wi-Fi, it's, it's good. It's not a hacking tool. It's more like an understanding tool. And this is their default view for the Wi-Fi Spectrum, so in the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz spectrum. Actually, that bottom one was something, a snapshot I took at the Black Hat keynote that Parissa Tabriz gave. It's just an insane number of access points. And when you look at a, a picture like this, you get the idea that the 5 gigahertz spectrum is a little bit bigger than the 2 gigahertz spectrum. But in reality, the 2 gigahertz spectrum has uh, three non-overlapping 20 megahertz channels. So if you put something on channel 1 and 2, they technically overlap. But the 5 gigahertz spectrum has 24 non-overlapping -overla um, channels. So what that means is if we were to draw this to scale, it looks a little more like this. There's way more 5 gigahertz spectrum available for Wi-Fi than there is 2.4 gigahertz. And so if you want to passively monitor all of that stuff, before, you know, you could do things like hopping channels and stuff. Now if you're hopping through all of these channels, you're just going to miss lots of it. So instead you have to engage in the very practical and very good looking attack like this. Um, it's really great for OPSEC. Clients, clients never see you coming. <laughs> it's the pineapple on the top, it distracts them. So that's not hugely practical to try and get, uh, figure out what devices are doing in the Wi-Fi around you. And we want to do it with that. You know, I'm from Africa, we're cheap. And um, so what we can do is we present ourselves as an access point. And wireless clients are already very good at finding access points and then broadcasting their management frames at them. So if we're an access point, then the devices come to us. We don't have to go to them and monitor all of the spectrum. Um, so this is why it's quite desirable to do some of these more active attacks rather than plain passive attacks for, for tracking purposes. The other thing that changed is devices are probing much less. Um, for some reason, we were a little prescient in 2014 with that, so we implemented something called loud mode, which provides an ability for mana and tools that use something similar to learn networks nearby and rebroadcast them. So maybe your device isn't actively probing for Bob's house of pain, 
but your older iPad in your back pocket is, or somebody you went there with last night is, and then we can learn that that's a network that somebody might be connecting to and rebroadcast it to your devices and learn uh, the nearby networks. But the problem we end up with is anonymous devices. So manufacturers wanted to make it that you couldn't uniquely identify devices. So increasingly they use these randomized MAC addresses and that's what you see flying around. Last year at DEF CON, Denton Gentry, or Gentry, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that, did some really cool work into creating uh, unique signatures for Wi-Fi devices. And that got built into host AP, which is predominantly what, what MAN is built off of. And so that gave us a really cool way of de-anonymizing devices. You probably can't tell, but I drew that myself. Um, okay, so let me give you a practical example of what that looks like. Thank you. I mean, this is the best part of the whole talk, just to be clear. All right, so if we've got four devices, so we've got four MAC addresses and they're all probing for some non-unique network called internet. So if they're probing for something unique, then maybe we could identify a device that, because no other devices are probing for that. But these ones, we don't know what device is which. Now the one thing we've implemented in MANA is random device detection, so the output will mark whether something's a randomized MAC address or not. So if we put that stuff in there, and this is taken from an actual MANA output and imported into Multigo, which makes this really easy. So we can see that there's two randomized MAC addresses and two non-randomized MAC addresses. So we can maybe start making some guesses that some belong to the other, but we don't know which randomized probe belongs to which legit MAC address, and we don't even know that these randomized probes belong to those MAC addresses. So what we did is we took Denton's work and we extended it to generate the signatures also for devices before association, so that in manner we can get these device signatures. So if we put that in there, this shows that there's two devices, so probe one and three belong to one device and probe two and four belong to another device. Um, so the, he did some really cool work and it allows us to effectively de-anonymize devices. So things like Snoopy can work again because you've got something like loud mode getting them to advertise the networks they connect to and then you've got signatures which allow you to de-anonymize the device so you can start tracking individual devices again and be creepy. And I'm not showing you lots of detail about how to do that stuff because for a change I put a lot of work into documentation. And so like the host APD MANA wiki's got a massive amount of information labeling all of the different configuration options and what they do and how to make it work. Um, I'll give you links to these things at the end so don't worry too much about taking pictures now. Okay, so that, that first scenario was talking about tracking and probing and it's, it's kind of well-trod territory. We've made some, some changes there um, but I didn't want to spend too much time on it. So next we're going to look at enterprise networks. So these are uh, EAP, PEEP, EAP TLS, kind of things that most people are running at companies. And um, so this is the domain where something like host APD WPE, wireless pwnage edition, has traditionally done its work. Um, MANA was also doing some of this stuff in, in 2014. We've made some changes there. The nice thing about having like both of this capability in MANA is you can get lots of devices to connect to you and you can also get lots of passwords from devices. So being good at getting devices to connect you also helps for this part. All right, so the most common implementation is the evil twin attack. Um, so this is Spock's evil twin from the mirror universe. And evil twin attack, you create an access point that looks the same as the legit access point that you want to go after. And like when people talk about it, they mostly say, yeah, oh, that's all you do, you just make another access point. But in reality, you've got fancy enterprise access points that implement all sorts of crazy 802.11ac stuff really well with well-engineered antennas, well-placed in the ceiling, and you're walking around with like a dinky alpha card in your backpack. Uh, you're probably not going to beat the enterprise AP. Uh, so what often happens is then people do things like deauths, um, and so people start implementing management frame protection, 802.11w, and this becomes much harder. So actually the way I'd recommend you do this is go buy a fancy enterprise access point like a Ruckus or an Aruba, and then you can use MANA as just a plain backend radio server, and it'll actually capture the creds there. Now this is something that's already implemented in host APD WPE, and uh, if any of you are familiar with Celeste Barber, so she takes uh, pictures of celebrities, and then she kind of rips them off, uh, and it's pretty hysterical. Most of them are her awkwardly wearing underpants, so this was the least awkward one I could find. Uh, and so we're the Celeste Barber to host APD WPE with, with MANA. So uh, Brad Antoniovich, Joshua Wright in 2008, they released the Free Radius WP and the Sleep Tools, which sort of were the first attacks against EAP networks where you could capture credentials and, and crack them. 
Uh, so that stuff's been in, in Mana for a while. Um, I've cleaned it up, cleaned the output up. Uh, people kept sending me rude messages saying I have to hand carve things into Hashcat and stuff, so now it just displays it right. But what I've also done is I've extended it so it does more EAP modes. So at the moment, it does about 13 different EAP modes. It'll try and capture credits, uh, plain text, CHAP, MS CHAP, MS CHAP version 2, GTC, things like that. Um, and about seven of those fairly well tested uh, in real client environments, and, and that's working quite well. Um, but we did some other stuff too that I want to take you through. So here's another back of the napkin drawing I attempted to describe uh, how EAP connections work. So the first thing that happens is a Wi-Fi connection. If you're familiar with um, Air Replay, if you do a fake auth, that's that first part. And then these tunneled EAPs, so PEEP or TTLS, their security comes from this uh, TLS session that it creates. So the idea is we use best practice TLS stuff, and then we can do crappy MS chap inside that tunnel because it's protected by TLS. Now, the, the sort of fundamental flaw in all of this, and I'll, I'll cover in a bit more detail now, is that uh, we don't have a very good way of validating certificates in the wireless world, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. And so then you've got this MS chap challenge response. Now, MS chap version 2 provides a method for proving that the access point knows the password and proving that the client knows the password. Uh, so what we did in 2014 is we did this auto crack and add thing so that if you capture the passwords, it'll try and crack it. And if it's weak enough, you can quickly add it to the radius users file. If the device tries to reconnect, you can then also man in the middle then. Uh, but then Brad in host APD WPE implemented something he called EAP success. So instead of doing that, because the access point can't prove that it knows the password if it hasn't cracked it, uh, it would just send an EAP success method back. Um, and I just, I thought this was silly because, you know, why would that work? And then Michael kept telling me I must make it work and he wouldn't let up, really wouldn't let up. And so I eventually spent a, a hot evening digging through code trying to figure this out. And what actually turns out is that um, all Mac and iOS devices um, have a broken implementation. Uh, so they won't validate that the access point actually knows the password if you send an EAP success. They'll just be like, okay, sure, I'll connect. So it's, um, I mean, from iOS 9, I've tested it on iOS, my latest one on here, my latest Mac OS. I've reported it to Apple. Uh, we kind of had the discussion on Twitter, so, uh, and Brad had built this functionality ages ago, so it's not really a zero day, but it's an interesting thing to, to know. So you don't need to use things like autocrack and add with iOS, they'll just connect. Um, and then the, the other thing is, is the certificate validation problem. So on the, Left-hand side is the legitimate certificate chain for DEF CON's Wi-Fi certificate. And on the right-hand side is a, a, a cloned um, version of that chain that I built using a colleague of mine, Rogan Dawes' tool called Apostille, which is good for cloning certificate chains rather than just an individual certificate. And now on something like iOS and um, some other supplicant devices, if you connect to a Wi-Fi network, it'll pop up the certificate. And it could be signed by a valid cert authority, and it'll still pop up the certificate for you to hand validate. So if I saw the certificate on the right and it had all the DEF CON things, everything looks exactly the same except for the, the fingerprint because of the, the hashes are going to come out differently. Um, and humans aren't very good at memorizing long strings of hashes. So for things that, that try and force you to validate on the actual certificate, that becomes problematic if you aren't doing automated rollout to client devices. And even then, if you are doing automated rollout to client devices, we've got this problem with IT where client devices tend to stop being compliant to your policies, and you always end up with that one MSO8067 or that one poorly configured supplicant. Then on the flip side, there's a bunch of supplicants which will validate on the CA, the Certificate Authority. So WPA supplicant used in Linux and Android does that. Uh, Windows' default configuration will do that. And so here you can see that DEF CON bought a certificate from DigiCert. So I can go spend $150. I mean, they know Let's Encrypt exists, right? Um, and then I can buy a certificate with the same CA. It doesn't have to be a DEF CON certificate. I can present that on my rogue access point and devices will co connect to it. I tested just to make sure I wasn't going crazy. I used DEF CON's configuration, complete with your username and your password all in bold, put up my rogue access point, and the thing's happily connected to it. So that, and there's no option in WPA Supplicant at the moment to validate on the actual certificate, which is kind of stupid. Um, and in Windows, you've got an option to validate on the actual host name. So you can see it's wifi-reg.defcon.org. 
I can't buy a certificate for defcon.org domain. So if you validate on the actual server name like defcon instructed you to, then actually Windows is in a pretty good place. And for iOS, they pushed out, um, yeah, that's only one guy. <laughs> Hope Microsoft's paying you well. Um, and then for iOS, they, they pushed out uh, a mobile profile, like an MDM profile, basically Apple configuration profile, to validate on the exact search, which works quite well, although I fat fingered it and I've not been able to connect to the Wi-Fi. Anyway, so we've got this problem with Wi-Fi search. So if any of you saw Parissa Terbriz's keynote at uh, Black Hat and she was talking about how they're trying to get rid of SSL or HTTP, HTTP pages and they've got this you know, consistent set of iconography, I was thinking what a nice problem to have. Like when your problem is just trying to get people to do something everyone knows they should and you need to make some icons more consistent. Wi-Fi devices don't even have a consistent way of validating server certificates. I mean, we're, we're in a pretty bad place there. And, and all of this is just talking about if somebody's actually trying to put effort into validation, because most of us and most users will click on the Wi-Fi network, type in your username and password, and yeah, whatever the certificate. Okay, but the general recommendation is to use something like EPTLS. So again, very advanced diagram of EPTLS. And what EPTLS does is it does away with the certificates, I mean the passwords, and you just have certificates. It's mutual authentication, so you've got a client certificate and you've got a server certificate. Yay, it's fixed, we'll just use EPTLS. Except the problem is with normal TLS, you create an encrypted tunnel and then the communications can continue. In Wi-Fi, it's a kind of a once-off authentication. Afterwards, the tunnel's torn down, then you have the WPA two-way handshake and the normal Wi-Fi stuff. So what that means is if the client is not validating the service certificate, then you can just accept whatever certificate it sends you and yay, now you're man in the middling um, EPTLS. So EPTLS isn't necessarily a fix for this. As a matter of fact, it comes down to the exact same security decision as PEEP or TTLS decisions is a single certificate validation of the server certificate. So all of that problem with the server, with certificate validation and Wi-Fi kicks back in. Um, so this was actually implemented in MANA in 2015 by Meatballs, thanks guy, uh, and then I broke it, sorry, um, and then I fixed it again about a month ago. So that works again. Okay, but then Michael one day was cracking some Wi-Fi hashes and he noticed that Hashcat, uh, let, me, let me go here for the moment, Hashcat uses mode 5500 I think for cracking MSChap hashes, which is also NTLM v1 ESS. And he thought, hey, there's this MTLM relay thing. Maybe I could do like an MS chap relay. And so he came up with uh, what he's calling sycophant. It's a play on supplicant. And so the idea is that you can have two separate devices. You can have MANA being a rogue access point, negotiating a session with a, a victim device. And then you can have WPA sycophant negotiating a session with a legitimate target access point. So those two don't need to be physically near each other. They just need an internet connection. So you can be targeting someone at their house and then have the, the other thing at the, um, the target organization. And what's really nice about this is you don't have to crack the password. So if it's a harder password to crack and it's gonna take a little longer, uh, you still get connected to the network fairly instantly. Um, and so Michael's gonna give you a, a demo of what that looks like and we're gonna release that tool set today. Thank you, Dominic. Um, so, I've got broken this demo down into three parts. Uh, the first two parts do happen simultaneously because the two things need to be happening at the same time. Uh, but the first part is I'm just going to show you what MANA looks like when it's uh, pretending to be in the corporate AP. And then the second part is a supplicant retrieving the required information from MANA to connect to the legitimate corporate AP. So in this scenario, we can imagine that there's a chap uh, at home. He's got his device for the BYOD network, but it also uses domain creds. So if we just relay this thing, we should be able to connect to the normal AP uh, or the normal legit corporate domain. So here's the command for for running mana, this we put on a pie and throw it in his garden and hopefully our access point is stronger than his uh, little router that he got from his internet service provider. And hopefully he's not got any of the certificates uh, properly pinned and those sorts of things. So I'm just scraping out the relevant information, otherwise there's a lot of uh, noise. So I'm just scraping for sycophant and mana. 
uh, I've added a config option to mana to say enable sycophant, which just instructs it to not use, to not generate, well, it still generates a challenge, but to not use that challenge, rather retrieve a challenge from my supplicant, sycophant, so that it may be passed to the, uh, the client. So I just run this, and we wait for a chat to connect. Here they've uh, initiated a connection with us. So the phase one identity and the phase two identity. Phase one establishes that outer tunnel. Phase two is starting the actual EAP, uh, the MS chap handshake. There is a delay after this because now Sycophant is starting up on the other side and is trying to play catch up. So it's quickly connecting to the actual corporate AP and getting the challenge which is then passed to Mana to present to the client so that we may get a uh, valid response. As you can see here, it's retrieved the, the first auth challenge contents is what host APD our rogue generated, but we don't want to use that one. So there's auth challenge contents after copy, which it's actually gone from the legit access point. We send that to the uh, client, John, in his bedroom, and his phone has decided that our access point looks more appealing. So it knows the password, it generates a response using our hash. Uh, Mana takes that response, writes it, to a f uh, writes it down to a file, and essentially passes it on to, um, to my sycophant. And we get the, the hash anyway in case we want to crack it later. Uh, yeah. So then next we have the other half of this uh, equation, which is uh, my sycophant, WPA sycophant. Uh, I'm running it using the the adapter ending in U6, thanks to the new naming convention. Once again, re grepping out the relevant data, and I'm also grepping for an EAP failure, which, just to show that there's not one. <laughs> uh, it's, so we run it. Oh, in the config is now, so this is now happening near, in proximity, in close proximity to the, an actual legit corporate AP, because we want to connect to it. So this portion has to run close to, close to your client. Right, so then you just put where you want to connect to in the config file uh, using the standard uh, well, supplicant syntax, uh, and we don't need creds, so we leave those blank. Cool. So what we got here is phase one came in, phase two came in, and uh, supplicant immediately, well, sycophant immediately starts to connect to the access point. It gets the challenge data, passes the challenge data to Mana and waits for the response. Mana at this point has been waiting for a little while. The client's been waiting for a little while. They're both edgy, and they immediately come back with the response. See here, the Mana contents. Cool, take that response. We pass it off to the access point. The access point goes, okay, cool. It, you showed me you know the password. Eep success, you're done. Now you're connected. Brilliant. I specifically didn't run DHCP uh, this time just to show this bit where we don't have an IP address. So I then run a uh, DHCP client just to get an IP. Uh, this is just to prove that we do have full comms to the network I connected to. Uh, I get an IP of uh, 10 I double check it. <laughs> and then I attempt to connect to a service or server on the uh, client's network with that I, well, I go back because I'm lazy and I copy it. But uh, yeah, essentially I'm going to connect to a web server on 8080, and we get, we automatically just connect to people's Wi-Fi. Cool, thank you very much. So yeah, we're gonna release that stuff today, um, WPS up of Sycophant and the mods to Mana, so that you can, you can do this attack yourself. Michael's used it successfully on some of our client engagements, so it's a practical working attack that works in live live environments. Um, and then to the most important part, coming up with a, a name, Michael sent me this image, which was deeply disturbing. <laughs> which we later found out was called Squirtle Boy, which was, <laughs> I'm not, not sure it made it less disturbing. So this is why we really want Michael to be known as Squirtle Boy from now on. Okay, so interestingly, back in, um, in 2002, uh, oh, I'm never gonna get these names, right, let me look them. 
look them up on my phone here. So um, Enno Sokan uh, with Niemi and Nyberg wrote a paper in 2002 about uh, Mallory in the middle tunneled uh, authentication modes. And from that, the IETF uh, spec for this thing in 2004 made sure it included a, a section on defending against these attacks. So if you zoom in, there's something called cryptographic binding or crypto binding. And the point of crypto binding is to make sure that some of the keying material used in the outer TLS um, session is used in the inner EAP method so that they can be, you know that they're the same device, that relaying isn't happening. Um, so it's always disappointing to implement an attack and think you're the first and then find out that the standards had a defense against it for over a decade. On the flip side, people don't seem to be turning on crypto binding, and we think that's really just because of a lack of practical attacks. That said, thanks to synchronicity, we were definitely not the first. So in 2014, Peter Robbins released a, a, a similar sort of an attack, but it was against a specific thing that Apple was doing, I think something around Leap, uh, in a YSEC paper in 2014, which Apple then fixed, so it wasn't a full implementation. And then this morning, 15 minutes before we woke up, somebody logged an issue against Mana asking for this as a feature request and linking to a paper that had been written in 2016 and sent to the FOSDEM mailing list by Siarhe Siniak. I'm so sorry for butchering that name. Um, and so he also has a partial implementation. It was done against the, the EAP state machine in host AP and WPS applicant. But as far as we could tell, it's not a full working practical implementation as yet. So we think this is the first practical implementation of this attack that can be, can be used by people. And so because there's no practical implementation of the attack, or certainly not a widely known one, what you see is that the default configs for a lot of networks don't turn on crypto binding. So here's a picture of Microsoft's radio server configuration. And by default, they will not disconnect clients that don't have crypto binding. Um, so because this is something that needs to be done on the client side, the access to the radio server can detect whether it's been done and disconnect clients, which makes it slightly less usable, I guess, but a bit more secure. So maybe that's why they didn't do it there, is they don't want to make it harder for people to get on the network. But here's a fully updated Windows 10 default connection dialog, and their crypto binding is not enabled either. Uh, host AP tries to do some crypto binding by default, so there are some places where they try to do it, but most people aren't running host AP networks in their enterprise organizations. Um, so for the most part, crypto, crypto binding doesn't seem to be turned on. Uh, you can go turn on crypto binding, but I think the biggest defense against these sorts of attacks is just to make sure that your client devices are properly validating the server certificate that gets presented. Because if that's done, then this part doesn't matter too much because they won't get past the tunneled, uh, the outer TLS negotiation because they'll say, that's not the right access point, you're fake. All right. Okay, so... Those first two scenarios is once the first one was getting a bunch of devices to connect to you and being able to figure out which device is doing what. And the second one was doing, doing EAP attacks. Oh, sorry, one other thing is you would have seen Hashcat and Atom's PMKID thing, anyone who's interested in WPA2 handshake cracking, uh, put some basic stuff in just to try, like if a client ever sends a PMKID to just log that into the same file. I need to do way more testing to see if that's, if it's a practical attack from a rogue access point perspective. Um, but that might be fun. Okay, so now we're going to look at some, some MITM stuff. So back in 2014, we released uh, the MANA toolkit. And the idea there was lots of people take and then you can MITM as, you know, for granted. But the reality was, uh, if, particularly if you're new to this, you have to sort of orchestrate networking and access point stuff and protocol stuff. And that can be quite, quite a lot to do. And then with the increase in certificate pinning and things like HSTS. Sorry, I'm just... Mm, it's about to get breathy. With things like certificate pinning and HSTS, it's not sort of a given that you're going to be able to man in the middle all the things and get all of the passwords. Uh, so the big problem we ran into with MANA Toolkit is the ability to construct pipelines. We were using IP tables to redirect traffic from one place to another place. So for example, you can SSL strip something, but you can't then pass the traffic through to SSL split. Maybe there's some IP tables gurus in here who can show us how to do it, but um, it wasn't, wasn't pleasant. Uh, and then along came BetterCap. So BetterCap written by Evil Socket in Go, uh, it, it can do all of this stuff and is really fantastic. So initially, I actually, we wanted to get uh, Evil Socket up on the stage to talk about some of this stuff. 
Uh, but he's got a whole bunch of really cool Wi-Fi attack things built into to better cap. So if you want to do captive portal attacks or you want to beef hook browsers through your mitten, um, all sorts of other things, then you can now do that with better cap. So we're just effectively deprecating mana toolkit and saying, use better cap. It's better. And just a big, big shout out to Evil Socket for the awesome work he's done in there. I know um, based on the issues that get logged, that guy takes some bullets. The other problem you face is trying to orchestrate uh, setting up a network and all the net, well, the Wi-Fi network and all of the networking. Okay, so I'm seeing people waving hands. And uh, Michael found a cool tool uh, written and maintained by a guy named Oblique called Create AP. And what this does is just makes it really easy to say, create an access point and bridge it between this network and this network or NAT it. As, uh, without all of the, the sort of complexity that Mana Toolkit br brought in. However, there were some things that it didn't do. It doesn't allow you to create EAP networks. It certainly doesn't allow you to do mana modes. And it doesn't allow you to create more than one Wi-Fi network. Sometimes you might want to create more than one Wi-Fi network because probes don't say what kind of security principle they're connecting to. So you might want to present an open PSK and EAP network and see which one it connects to. So Michael made Berate AP, which is a fork of Create AP. Uh, that can do all of these things. It's something else we're releasing today. So it does all that networking and access point orchestration for the most obvious ways in which you would use Mana Toolkit to do this stuff. If you want to get into the, the, the detail of all the other config options, then you can handcraft your own config files and do it that way. We've written it all up in the wiki, uh, but this just makes life much easier. So that's an example. Ignore the dash N that crept in there. But this is an example of setting up a, a managed EAP malicious access point uh, that's, if you don't have the dash, and natting traffic from WLAN 0 to S0 called Evil Corp. And that's, if any of you have used Mana Toolkit or edited some of the scripts, this is way easier than any of the stuff um, we did before. Okay, and then there's also a bunch of really cool proportionality options that have been built into Mana. See, it's a sniper rifle, proportionality. So, by default, man is a bit of a flamethrower, like it'll just target every device it sees and any network it sees. But if you're on an engagement where you've got specific scope, you might want to limit it to specific devices or specific networks. Um, or if you're in law enforcement or something and you've got a specific mandate, you might want to limit what it does. So we built a bunch of options in there like SSID filters that was um, contributed by a guy named CyberDevil. Uh, but one of the things that we think is really cool is we extended Mac ACLs down to a management frame level. So any of you should be familiar with uh, the way Mac address ACLs work on Wi-Fi. You know, your home router does it. You can say only these Mac addresses can connect. Uh, you can see the AP, but if you try and connect and you're not in there, you'll get rejected. So we brought that down to management frame level. So if the access point receives a probe request, sorry, if the management, if the access point receives a probe request from a disallowed uh, MAC address, then it's not even going to respond to the probe request. So that means, for the most part, it won't even show up in their list of available networks. Also provides some ability to kind of hide from um, people who might be looking for these devices or wireless intrusion prevention systems. Uh, we think it's quite cool. And then I borrowed a concept from uh, the Aircrack guys. They've got this idea of binary net masks so that you can kind of mask out certain bits in a MAC address. So you can do things like anything with this OUI, you know, any of these devices can connect, but these can't. Uh, but it also allows you to do things like for randomized MAC addresses, go full mana on them. But when they try and connect, be a little more circumspect about checking what the, the MAC address is. So it's a really flexible way of dealing with, with different MAC addresses. And then lastly, the, if you want to get into Wi-Fi hacking, it's really difficult to practice. On the one hand, you've got to buy hardware. You've got to make sure the chipset works with what you're doing. Uh, so, for example, the, those new black alphas, the chunky ones, those things, because they're doing more stuff in firmware, you can't use manners, um, probe manipulation stuff. The radio stuff will work, but not, not those things. So you've got to make sure you get the right hardware. Uh, and then also it's really difficult to kind of not target people you don't mean to. You know, you might be testing between your two devices, but it's meanwhile, it's like man in the middling, somebody next door. Anytime somebody's playing with the stuff in the office, we just plug into the wired network because it's just like dosing the, the Wi-Fi. I've even had really weird situations in busy environments where it ends up kind of dosing Bluetooth, um, which is kind of strange. 
So in 2014, we built some CTFs in AWS where you could practice Wi-Fi hacking, which we're kind of proud of because Wi-Fi in the cloud is a thing now. And uh, today we're going to release some Docker images that let you, well, at the moment it's one Docker image, but hopefully some more Docker images in the future that allow you to practice some of these, these things. So you don't need any hardware. It's not going to target any live live environments, and you've got some kind of known completion criteria, so you can make sure that you're able to run these commands and they work. So that's actually Michael in the picture there, if you look carefully. And Michael's a kendo nerd, and he told me that these wooden swords are, are called chennais. So hardest problem in computer science, naming things. So I'm calling the environment chennai uh, And I'm just going to show you a little silly demo of what that looks like. So here's the Docker, Docker container running on my Mac. Uh, there's a whole nother story about, so if, you, if you're running Docker for Mac, just don't try and do this on that. There are ways, but like I'm currently was asked to politely take that stuff down by Docker. Um, so rather do it on, on your Kali's or your Linux boxes, because it needs certain kernel modules. But okay, so here's a Docker container. It doesn't have anything, any hardware plugged into it. So if we look, there's a WLAN zero which means there's a Wi-Fi device. Uh, and if you, if you use Airmon, you'll see that that's a software simulator of 802.11 radios. So there's this kernel module, Mac 802.11 HW sim, which allows you to simulate fake Wi-Fi devices that can connect to each other. And so if you then run, if you put one of those devices into monitor mode, we've got some sticky chip sticky tape and chewing gum in the background which tries to figure out when you're, you're doing these things. So if you run AeroDump, you'll actually see Wi-Fi networks and devices that are there. Again, no hardware, these aren't real things. Uh, there's a WPA handshake, so you can try and capture that handshake. If you bring up a, a, a MANA network, you'll see uh, clients trying to connect to you. You can capture those credentials and crack them, and you can do all of this without needing any actual hardware. Uh, so yeah, we're going to release that Docker image. You can just Docker pull it, um, run it, and and away you go. And that's that's kind of the end of our our talk. So we're gonna we want. I bought a domain called Wi-Fi.net, but with ones w1f1.net. Uh, so a little bit later after this, if somebody will lend me a computer, thanks guys. Um, I'm gonna push uh, all of the tools we mentioned up there so that you can grab it. Um, so don't be disappointed if you do it right now. Uh, we'll try and go to the chill room and do it. And we also just want to use that as a bit of a repository for kind of how to do these attacks and which tools are working. Um, keep updating that as time goes. And maybe if some of you are playing with things in this room and it's going well, you can send pull requests or, or write wiki things for up there. Uh, otherwise, you can, you can tell us you hated the talk on Twitter. So I'm at Singe and he's underscore cable thief. And we're going to check if Squirtle Boy is available. And uh, we're, we're from SensePost. So thank you very much for your, your time and patience.